What I'm starting up is Rose Garden, which is a fantastically good MIDI editor. QSynth, which is a synthesizer. Rose Garden's Flash. And we should also get Jack running in the background. That's the system capture device, so that's your input microphone. I'm just disconnecting it from um, Rose Garden in case it feeds back like it did in testing. So. Okay, so we just heard a piece by Mozart. I'll take you quickly through what Rose Garden has to offer and then I'll move on to Arda. But um, just here we see a, uh, a small preview of what's going to be played so you can get an idea of what you're looking at and what you're about to hear on screen if you're going to do some editing. And if we have a look at the notation editor. This is the um, actual notes being played, and this is probably the strongest point for me from Rose Garden, is that you can write notation as you're thinking about it, and then have it play back for you and whenever you need it, which is just beautiful. So for example, if I take a note, I can drop it on the screen. Doesn't sound like Mozart, but he places them a lot better than I do. You can all still hear that okay? So that's the notation editor, which is very handy. But most uses for Rose Garden, you'd um, use the MIDI editor. Which looks like this. So you've got your keyboard down here. And you would write your note by placing a value for the keyboard with MIDI, so note, duration, velocity, everything that you need to instruct the computer how to play that note. That note gets passed through Rose Garden through to your MIDI player, which in this instance is QSynth, which I'll show you a little bit of later on. There's more than a few super good synthesizers for use in Linux. It is one of its strong points. Just to give you an idea of what sort of things we're looking at here in MIDI. So this is an example of a note, one E note. It's a bit harder to see on this resolution, but um, let's take that one. So that's the time the note starts, the duration the note goes for, the pitch, D4 and the velocity that it comes in at, various other bits of information that you're passing through to say this is how I want the note played exactly. 
Obviously it takes a lot of time to plug in MIDI manually. Most people don't do it. They'll use a MIDI controller, a piano keyboard or guitar or something like that, which can pass MIDI signals live into your computer. Um, there are some very, very patient people who like to program p computers for music, but I'm not really one of them. I'll show you a little bit about QSynth now just to give you an idea of how the synthesizer, synthesizer works. Each one of these tabs is a, um, a uh, preset sound, let's say. And if I show you Jack, Jack is the thing that's connecting everything together. So I've got two instances of QSynth. Q synth up. I've got Rose Garden. I've got my system inputs. And this is all under the audio tab. There's also a MIDI tab and an ULSA tab. Under the MIDI tab, I just added a virtual keyboard, which I can connect into my Q synth. And it's just like a patch bay. So basically, you've got every single input and output device of your applications open and running. You can connect them all to each other however you want. It's particularly useful when you're processing sound or making effects or connecting up your effects rack to your recording device. And it's very, very easy to use. So in that way, I've connected this keyboard up to the Q-Synth. And I can play that just like an ordinary piano if I had really great skills with a mouse. Um, so normally you'd have a MIDI device plugged into your laptop and you'd be playing it that way because it's a hell of a lot easier than using the keyboard. That's about all. Oh, I'll show you one more thing. Just kill a few of these extra applications. So Rose Garden is excellent for MIDI work. Um, a lot of the work I use it for is for recording audio directly into the computer. A lot of my gear is very cheap. Uh, like Jonathan was saying, the Firewire devices are quite expensive. This is my first version of a home studio on Linux, so the hardware, as we've seen earlier, ain't that reliable. And the interface that I'm using is just the AC97 card controller that comes on the laptop. And the instruments that I use are, you know, $100 guitar, $100 keyboard with a cord between them. So it ain't high-tech stuff. And it does have a lot of hiss on the line. But um, as you heard before, if you're just working within the laptop, the sound quality isn't too bad. We don't want to change Mozart. So this is um, just a, a test piece I did. With three guitars running, running one after each other and a rhythm section on top of it. So you get the hiss from three guitar lines and a keyboard line coming through on every single track. So bear with it that it's quite raw, but you kind of get the idea of what the thing can do. Rose Garden's pretty good for this sort of stuff, but there's no real control over the inputs that you've got and the mixing and the sound quality that you're getting out of it. So if I'm going to do recording of audio, I usually use Arda, Ardor.
Mind you, most of this stuff is just me playing around, so it's not being used for anything except for my fun. Whoops. It's a little bit hard to capture it all on screen here, but um, so this is a rather large piece. which I'll play to give you an idea of what it sounds like. All right. So with Arda, each track here, not including your master track, which is what everything gets mixed through in the end to go through it to your outputs, each track's designated as an instrument. So I've got a Mesa loop. Uh, this is a piece of music that I stole from the internet. There's an instrument out there called the Misa Digital Guitar, which is basically a MIDI guitar with a MIDI interface on it. It's very, very naff looking and, and is an open source Linux built machine. So check it out. It's quite funny. Uh, and also quite good, mind you. Um, so I stole a bit of that loop from the internet, used a looping uh, piece of software called Freewheeler to generate something like a rhythm track and laid drums and keyboards and guitar over the top of it. I'll mute these up to start with so I can bring them in one by one to make it a little bit more interesting. going in. So each one of those is a, an iterative take. So I've started off with a drum tech or a rhythm track. I've added drums on top of that to the next track. I've added guitar on top for the next track, keyboards on top for the next track, vocals on top, so on, so on. And um, the nice thing about working with Arda instead of Rose Garden for this sort of work is that when you have, say, a couple of different instruments, you can do a lot better balancing in terms of the sound stage. So you can shift your guitars all the way to the right, your keyboards all the way to the left, you can have your instruments out the front. Um, it makes mixing a lot easier. It does have a very nice mixer. Uh, if you can see that there. Each column here represents each row within the waveform editor. And you've got balancing panners down there and individual volume on each channel. Um, plus, each channel can be separately uh, channeled or separately uh, looped in and out of ARDA. So let's just say I wanted to have um, one of my keyboards, say, um, going out to an effects rack and then coming back to re-record at a slightly different pace, say maybe to simulate an echo or, or a reverb, um, I can pass that out into an effects rack and then pass it back into ADA, do any number of processing, uh, processing bits on that sound wave. Shut that down for now. So once I've finished with a track using Arda or Rose Garden, I'll export it to a file. Um, usually I'll use a WAV file because it's easy for me to pass around to all my other laptops or sound devices. Audacity 
is what I'll use to do final mixing or mastering of the work. Um, it's nice and basic and easy to use. It lets you see the waveforms easily and um, doesn't complicate things too much. So I think this is an example of that piece of music there. Um, you can see the waveform there on both channels, left and right, has been clipped at the front so that it fades in and clipped at the back so that it fades out. Because I was working with that really rough loop at the beginning, I had to make a nice big synthesizer squeal over the top so you didn't notice the jarring start of the loop. And then I had to fade in over that because that was too loud and was drowning out everything else. Uh, it's been slightly compressed because the work I did was so loud when I recorded it the first time. I'll just show you what it is. Start from the beginning. example of the sort of effects that are available in whoopee in this um, we might run a phaser over it so this is not normally the thing I do to a you know a finished song but it would be useful if I had a particular a uh, guitar track or line of something that I wanted to give it a, a little bit of a different sound. So you can see there the differences in the waveform. That it's So that's basically the process. Um, the main thing, I suppose, that I want to bring out of this is the uh, quality of those applications that you're using. Rose Garden and Arda and Audacity, including Jammin, which I didn't show you because it doesn't run that great on my low CPU computer, um, are all really, really good for your sound processing jobs. Using Macs, using PCs, I've never been able to get the quality or the stability of the system as I do with Linux. Um, it's not generally recognized as a sound platform in pro audio world, um, not being a pro audio technician, but there's very few studios out there that'll be using Linux. Uh, there was one in Melbourne for a long time called Laughing Boy Records that had a very nice setup, but they closed down last year or so. Um, but really, if they knew the capabilities of this stuff and had the ability to use it like the support that you get for the Windows and Mac world, <coughs> considering how rock solid the platform is and how good the software that runs on top of it is, it basically kicks ass over the rest of it. Uh, so just to give you an idea of all the different applications that come here, and all the utilities that are available. So that's about it for me. Um, there's a lot there that I could show you, but I think we probably run out of time. So have you got any questions? Have I? All right. They gave me the five minute card. <laughs> um, all right, so if we've got a bit more time. Uh, we might have a look at maybe some of the loopers and things like that because they're quite interesting in what they can do if we can get it to run properly. Woohoo! Right, so this is a looper called freewheeling. Um, basically every single key on the keyboard allows you to hold a loop 
So if I get some input of some sort, and this is going to sound really daggy because I think the only input I've got is my external mic. I'll just use one channel to try and stop it feeding back. See I'm recording there. See I'm recording there. So that's just running in a loop by itself. I'm recording there. And you can hear me say I'm recording that. Really nice. See I'm recording there. Test one, two. See I'm recording there. See I'm recording there. Test one, two. I'm recording there. These sort of things you can use over and over again to make beats or whatever. Plus, you can also feed your instruments into it, like I did with the piece of digital guitar track to make back and loops or test computers that you want to then sample onto your sampler. And recording that. Um, turn that off because it's too scary too. But, um,. Also have a look at maybe some of the synthesizing software that comes with it. Uh, Zynad SubFX is a pretty old synthesizer for Linux. It's been around for a while and it's good. Um, Like most synthesizers, it's kind of based on a DX7 style of thing. You can choose a whole bunch of banks and preset them up so that you've got them ready to play if you're doing a performance or something like that. And as before, it needs to be connected up with Jack so that you can actually use it to do anything. Uh, my audio out. I suppose the nice thing with um, working on Linux is that when you do work with the instruments inside it and you want to do something a little bit more interesting with it, you have got an immense number of tools to work with. Um, we might maybe We'll have a look at Jackrack. So Jackrack's a series of plugins. It's like you have a guitar pedal with a whole bunch of different noises in it. This is basically the same sort of thing. So we're going to throw a bit of distortion upon that nasty keyboard sound that we had before. That's what it sounded like. When we plug it into Jack, if we disconnect it from the playback. plug it into the jack rack in, put the jack rack out to the system playback. And 
turn it on. If you then modify the sound that way and building through loops and loops and loops of your rack effects or the different applications that you want to run through, make as many sounds as your heart desires. Um, I think I might leave it there. If anybody else has got anything they want to ask, go ahead. Neither am I. using Sibelius, uh, full orchestral score. Yep. How, how would what you can do here compare with what he can do with this? Right. Sibelius is... Uh, a sampled orchestra package. So a company's gone out and gotten all the different instruments from the orchestra and sampled every instrument within every range within certain parameters and then produce that as a package which you can then upload into your system using whatever PC, Mac. There's a huge industry built around Mac and PC sound system. People like, uh, or vendors who produce Sibelius, market directly to those industries and um, produce their packages solely to run upon those pieces of software. Linux doesn't compare in that direction. When you're talking about full, full orchestral scores, there is some stuff out there, and there's some very good stuff out there. As you saw, that piano sound that came with the, um, that I played first off, is not that bad. Um, but yet, yeah, there is a difference between Linux and the PC and Mac world in that respect. There's a lot of products out there that just won't run on Mac, uh, won't run on Linux. That um, you know, a lot of money and a lot of development gets put into. Under Wine? Under Wine, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a package called FST. Uh, it will load the VST plugin and produce and get the jack boards for the So Nice. Yeah, so it, it's, it is very nice actually. Yeah. Uh, it means you can use jack as a core of your audio setup and then actually use it. It opens you up to a lot of software because there is a lot more available under the uh, mm. Well, I'm still working through the plethora of stuff that I've had, you know, in the past couple of years, and I'm nowhere near exhausting any of the stuff that I'm playing with. So, yeah, probably the other the other thing that was just pointed out then too is that in a lot of cases, Linux has the ability to uh, like has the um, the programs to be able to play back your orchestral stuff and whatnot. And when you look at programs like Sibelius, the application itself is fairly complex in what it can do. But I would probably hazard a guess that the big, like, of in terms of the, t the total cost of investment to develop that, that the sample libraries are probably the biggest component of that. Mm. And at least in theory, we should be able to make use of a lot of those sample libraries because they're just samples. But because they want to keep these things proprietary, they lock them up in their own formats that are generally encrypted, decryptable only by their own engine. And that's really where the problem lies, is that you know, to, to record orchestral samples, as some of you would be aware, is extraordinarily expensive. Um, and in the open source world, you know, unless somebody does a Paul Davis and like, effectively donates hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of time and effort, to the community, that we are unlikely to find those high quality samples that we could then plug into these synthesizers like fluid synth and stuff like that. Um, and you know, I think it, it's a problem, and I don't know that there's an easy solution to it. I mean, Ardor is only where it is because Paul Davis was extremely generous with his time in the early days of the development, in that he did. You know, a lot of that early, a lot of the groundwork was done, and he was he self-funded himself, um, and we'd be nowhere near where we are now if it wasn't for that. And with sample libraries, I think it's a similar thing. We've got projects like the Open Sound Library. Oh, sorry, um, what's it called? Open Sound, I think it is. Mm. OpenSound.org, which is like an effects library on the net, 
um, which is actually for, for effects and stuff is really, really good. And I use it all the time for theatre work. Um, but again, the quality of those recordings uh, isn't consistent and really isn't of the same quality as you get if you hire out a studio and actually record that stuff. But again, that's where the expense is. And I don't know if there's an easy solution to that. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the, the experience I've had, which is like try, try demo plugin, it does exactly what I want. I'm prepared to pay money for it, um, get the finished product, and find that it doesn't work uh, under emulation, not because uh, of, of the emulation, but because the licensing restrictions are too late. Yeah. So the comment basically there was that the um, the emulation will often work. With in terms of the program functionality, but the licensing methods that they use, like iLock and stuff like that, basically doesn't work through that emulation layer, and and that's true. And yeah, exactly. And 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 that's a problem with a lot of this proprietary stuff. It, you know, uh, the um, the pro audio industry has mostly standardised on iLock as the method of licensing a lot of this stuff. And of course, you know, it's it's a proprietary encrypted thing and you've got no way of, you know, we, we really don't have a way of being able to deal with that under Linux. So even, as, as you said, you can get the, you know, the code runs, but because of the in issues with the iLock, it won't license itself and it will refuse to run. and. Yeah, it's a problem, and I don't think anybody has a solution to it that I've heard of at the moment. It's it's one of those things, and um, yeah, there's nothing inherently problematic about using the samples or anything like that. It's just that yeah, the licensing is is difficult and awkward in the context of the way that we're forced to have to use it. So yeah, agreed. your earlier talk on real-time audio, uh, which is just one thing that I um, uh, thought, thought was interesting to notice, that you talk about the, the necessity for low latency uh, in a production environment or a particularly a performance environment. Um, but uh, what's interesting to mention is what low latency actually means. Uh, in the context of audio and musical production, uh, for musical playback, you want a latency in the range of 5 to 10 milliseconds is workable, ideally under 2. Mm. Uh, and uh, that is an order of magnitude different uh, from what a stock uh, kernel is going to deliver you uh, out of the box. Uh, so, I mean, this is the, ma the, the major um, benefit of moving to a real-time kernel, which is, that is actually going to uh, give you that, uh, that kind of performance. That being said, there's another problem, which is you might be able to get that uh, uh, performance at that latency um, in ideal conditions, Almost always you find a situation where there are bottlenecks in the applications that you are using, and at that stage they start dropping out and they start uh, producing these, these run errors. I've actually never had a problem with X runs on Linux, hmm. ever. Um, I've had... I've, uh, I've chewed up too much CPU from trying to do too much processing on an audio file, but I've never had an X run on an input and I've never had X run on an output. Mind you, my recording is one line only. Um, something like Laughing Boy Studios down in uh, Victoria. I know his production environment has six processors or six CPUs joined up with NetJack. Uh, he can get 40 input and 40 output channels going at once. He gets sub two milliseconds as his response time. Absolutely no X runs whatsoever. Um, I'm not a pro audio technician, so really, I can't give you a really good answer on that. For my uses, I've found it to be absolutely awesome. It kicks ass over my PC. Well, I don't own a Mac, but. I think with the latency, the issue of the latency as well, um, 
it does very, like the minimum latency you can get on any Linux system very much depends on the hardware that you're using to get your inputs and outputs. Um, just to, I mean, to put some numbers to it, I've heard, I have heard, I haven't personally done it myself, but I've heard of people who have managed to get um, sub five millisecond latency uh, on the Firewire stuff with Fado, which is pretty amazing. Um, although admittedly, the last time I pushed it was a couple of years back and I only had single core CPUs then. So um, yeah, sub five millisecond on that is actually pretty impressive. With PCI, in theory, you should be able to do better than that. Um, and there are way, I mean, there are ways of increasing your channel count without compromising some of this stuff as well. And that really, I mean, even with the higher end, um, the Fireface UC from RME, which has just been released, um, that purports to have 60 IO, 60 in, 60 out. But really, once you start needing that number, you really should just get a MADI card and use MADI to get it in and out of the PC because it's designed for that sort of thing. It's 64 channels per, uh, per MADI port um, and it's designed for that sort of thing. So you whack a couple of those and you've got 128. Um, and with MADI, with the MADI cards, um, in theory at least, you should be able to get down below your, you know, well below your five milliseconds as well. But then it, that assumes, of course, that you've got enough CPU power to be able to handle everything that you're doing in the time allotted. And um, to, a, to a point that becomes less of a real-time kernel thing and more of a CPU loading thing. Um, yeah, to that extent as well, taking a stock kernel and improving real-time performance, but mostly uh, of any um, hardware improvement that you can take uh, to uh, improve those odds, um, a faster CPU is what's going to buy you a lot later. Yeah, that's it. I mean, at the moment, our current recommendation with the FATO thing is that you know if you're wanting five to ten millisecond latency, you just run a stock kernel with the low latency desktop. That's that's where it is now. Now that 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 18 months ago, two years ago, that was not the recommendation, and that's just because of what Roderick was saying in the earlier talk about how a lot of that real time stuff has actually trickled down into the mainline kernel now and continues to do so, and that over time, I think the needs. You know, hope, what we're hoping for is that eventually most of the stuff that's important to audio does trickle down there, and, and we're getting there. And the fact that we can now get sub 10 milliseconds on FATO with a stock kernel illustrates just how much of that stuff has actually burrowed down, has, has trickled into mainline finally. So, yeah. So what, what isn't in the mainline kernel now that was... What isn't in the mainline kernel now? Did you want to take that? Uh, I can try. <laughs> Right. With the low latency desktop settings, basically most of your threads and processes and your interrupts are brought under scheduler control. So there's much more chance that your real-time audio application is going to run as you expect it to within certain predefined limits of being able to have access to resources soon enough. With the real-time patches, um, it also brings in... Uh, more of the kernel code, so there's less. It add, adds addition. It adds a different uh, additional preemption points. Yeah. I'm not an expert on the RT patch myself. It's been a while since I've looked at it, since I haven't needed to. Um, but I believe that it increases. It adds additional uh, scheduling points into blocks of kernel code that would previously be be out. You know, be non-preemptible. Um, I believe that there's some RCU work. That went in, although actually is preemptible ICU in now. Yeah, yeah, that that was very recently. Um, they changed the way the interrupt handlers work, I think, still a little bit. Um, although when they did the threaded interrupt, when they changed the uh, stock kernel to threaded interrupt handlers about six or so months ago, that helped heaps. Um, so there's there's. I, I personally view the RT kernel now for audio work as more finessing rather than as a major we must have this to get any sort of real work done as it was two or three years ago. 
um, you know, a lot of the stuff that was important for audio work has now managed to get through and get in. Um, and for certain workflows, there's still some of that upper level stuff that the RT hasn't got into a mainline yet that we still use. So users like Roderick still need it. Um, but in a lot of cases now, um, a lot of the big ticket stuff has actually got through. The big kernel lock removal um, has been another thing that's sort of come to fruition in the last two uh, in the last two releases. So I think at the moment now we're at the point where RT sort of finesses us for audio work, um, whereas two years ago um, it was almost essential if you wanted essential? if you wanted to get that sort of thing happening. Try it. Yeah. If it doesn't work for you, the downloads, you know, there's a dozen yeah. ones you can download and try. Yeah, the, the, again, for the purpose, uh, purposes of the video, the comment was that for somebody starting out with this stuff, there's no need to recompile a kernel. And I would say that is completely, I'd agree with Roderick, that is true. Um, down the track, if you start pushing things and you discover that, yes, you need to because of the way you're working or what you're doing, then that's down the track. But I think it's at the point now where certainly you can get into this stuff, you can start having a play and messing around um, with stock kernels and you don't have to get into that, that sort of thing at the present moment. We'll take a couple more, uh, one or two more questions, but it's afternoon tea now, so. Yeah, just quickly following on from that, if you do find yourself in a situation where you need to rebuild your kernel, last time I went looking just about a month ago, the RT patches were no longer maintained. Uh, that's before I started, after I started looking at it, so yeah, you might be right. I, I wouldn't expect that to be correct. The, the status of the RT kernel patches, as I understand it, is that there was a long hiatus um, because Thomas and Ringo uh, and uh, In Ingo got uh, sort of sidetracked with a few other bits and pieces, um, but they started up the maintenance of them again around the dot thirty two, dot thirty three line. I think dot thirty three is the latest that's out at the moment, maybe. But my understanding is that it's still their intention to keep them maintained. Um, it's just that obviously it's not you know, it's not a high priority on their work at the moment and so they basically get to it when they get to it. But I haven't seen any announcement that says that they don't intend to keep supporting it at this point at this present moment. My And that's true. Yeah, more because more and more of it has got into mainline. You're correct. Um, the call for it isn't as great anymore. Like a lot of the, like in a, probably 90% of audio users are no longer complaining and saying we need this stuff to do our work. And audio users were one of the loudest voices. Um, but a lot of the embedded guys still need some of that stuff in there, and and so on and so forth. Because we're certainly not the only users of that stuff. So, and I think it's recognised, and I, I mean, my understanding is that it's still maintained, but yeah, it may not be maintained at quite the frequency that it used to, simply because a vast proportion of the use cases have been taken care of now. So it's just a case of prioritising, and the fact that there's not that many people who are working on it. So any more questions for Roderick? No? Awesome. Well, let's uh, thank Roderick again.